So uh, I'll begin by saying a few things in general about the MRC program. Uh, as, as you may know, it is a, uh, a fairly long-standing program at the American Mathematical Society, a professional development program offering early career mathematicians a, a rich array of opportunities to develop collaborative research skills, to build a network focused on an active domain of research, and to receive mentoring from leaders in that area. This is a program that's funded through a generous grant from the National Science Foundation, uh, as well as from funds that uh, AMS provides and that uh, some private donors provide. This is a, a year long experience for those who are accepted into the program. Uh, the centerpiece of the program is a one week long intensive hands-on collaborative research conference that takes place in the summer. Uh, this year, those conferences will take place uh, in the uh, very first two weeks of June. We'll say a bit more about those in a few minutes. Uh, the program also provides participants uh, funding to travel to the joint meetings um, after this summer. So that would be in uh, January of 2023. Uh, there are opportunities for career building, uh, for there's support for travel, for small group collaboration that follows up on the activities of the summer conference. And there are longer term opportunities for collaboration and community building among the participants. So uh, this is a, a program that uh, by our experience has considerable value for those who participate. And I invite you to have a look at the AMS webpage uh, in fact, if you look at the alias ams.org slash MRC, I believe it will uh, take you to the, the general landing page and you can see quite a bit of information, both present and past and some future uh, about this program. So um, I believe that uh, pretty well summarizes things other than to say that we have uh, applications open at this moment. Uh, those run until February 15th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. The target audience for this is early career mathematicians, that is, those who are, generally speaking, uh, within a couple of years of finishing a PhD, up to those who have completed a PhD within the past five years. Uh, the goal, as I indicated earlier, is to provide those cohorts with these uh, research experiences and professional development opportunities. So with that, I think I'll uh, uh, stop my uh, discourse and turn it over to Melissa to talk a little bit about the, uh, the summer conferences, which are the, the centerpiece of our program. Hi, everyone, and welcome to um, this informational session. I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to give you a little information. So I'm going to give you nothing to do with the content of the conferences, but mostly the logistical perspective on things. So uh, for this year, for the first time, we're going to be using a resort in upstate New York called Beaver Hollow. And this is a lovely picture of it in the fall. We will not be there in the fall. But of course, my slide won't advance. There we go. Now it went too fast. There we go. So Beaver Hollow is, as I mentioned, located in upstate New York. Um, it's about, about 300 acres of reserve in the town of Java Center, which is approximately 40 minutes from Buffalo. Um, participants generally travel from their home or their institution to the MRCs on the Sunday um, arrival day and departing on Saturday morning. Um, ground transportation is arranged by myself or one of the other conference coordinators. There are four of us on staff. So each week we'll have a conference coordinator dedicated to support the participants and the organizers for that week. Once you're there, you don't have to think about much. All meals are provided, um, starting with a dinner on Sunday night when you arrive and concluding on Saturday morning when you depart. We feed you entirely too much. So it is our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you have any special dietary concerns or allergies, please let your conference coordinator know um, and we will do our best to accommodate them. 
Sessions traditionally start on Monday morning um, and they conclude on Friday afternoon to give you a sense. So really you are there from Sunday until Saturday and you're completely immersed in the program during that time. Participants will be housed in shared guest rooms. Um, they're located in some lodges with multiple guest rooms and some individual villas. Um, once you're accepted to the program, we provide you with some resources so you can select roommates to share your space. Uh, the rooms do include uh, two beds and a private bathroom and all of the amenities of a modern hotel room. Uh, once you're on site, we have a variety of meeting space available. So these are some pictures. Um, each conference will have their own program. So there will be two conferences taking place at the same time during each week. So we'll make sure that there's space allocated throughout the property to meet the needs of that conference. We'll have several large group spaces where we can have plenary style events, including an auditorium, as you can see in the top left hand corner of your screen. Um, all the meeting space has access to Wi-Fi. In fact, the whole property has access to Wi-Fi um, and there'll be AV technology available in each of the rooms as well as anything else that you could need. So we'll have flip, flip charts and markers and papers and pens. Um, and we do have an office on site so we can supply you with anything extra you need. So this is the small group space. So a huge component of the MRCs um, that the organizers will tell you is small group work. So we do provide space on property for you to break into smaller groups. Um, we'll have some formal space, like you can see here where there'll be AV and technology, but it's a beautiful location. So we're really encouraging people to utilize the property. So there are some spaces outdoors, there's porches and covered areas. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of dragging some flip charts outside and spending some time collaborating if you don't need that technology. So on property, there's recreational activities. So the program does run Monday through Friday, um, pretty solid. However, there's time in the evenings and the mornings for you as well as a lunch break. And then on Wednesday afternoon, we like to give you some free time. So you'd be able to utilize all of the amenities um, while you're there for the week. So there's hiking, I'm not gonna read through the whole list, but there's hiking, there's lots of different outdoor activities and sports. There's a gym, there's indoor and outdoor pools for anybody who likes to swim. Um, it's a beautiful property with a lot of things to take advantage of so that when you're not doing math, you have a way to unwind. So the role of your conference coordinator. So I will be, when I'm there and I will work with a group every, um, every year, starting at the very beginning, once acceptances come through, you'll be working with me on um, completing paperwork, registration, housing, we kind of take care of everything for you. So you'll start at the very beginning with your conference coordinator communicating your travel to make sure that it's reimbursable, um, letting us know any special requests that you have for housing or for meals, uh, arranging the ground transportation by providing your flight information. Once the conference is started, um, your conference coordinator is there to help with everything. So they're there to help if you have AV needs on site or if you should need um, something for food or for your housing. Um, we work directly with the Beaver Hollow staff to make sure that you have um, a good successful meeting um, and that you have everything that you need while you're there. Post-conference, we collect your vouchers. We fulfill them for you. We support the work of the uh, participants who are reporting out on your experience. And then after that, we continue on later on in that year with you to help you plan for your participation in the JMM. So there are some more pretty pictures. Uh, Beaver Hollow is a lovely place. The MRC is a really unique conference experience. Um, I've been working on these conferences for 11 years. It's a very specific sort of experience. And I think that this property will allow you to immerse yourself in your work but um, enjoy some natural uh, beauty while you're there. So um, you have a special bond with your conference mates and you have a really great experience working. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. So, well, uh, we are then I think ready for each of our organizer groups to uh, say a bit about their specific MRC conferences. I mentioned those a moment ago. And um, so we'll begin with uh, week one, uh, the applied category theory MRC and Daniel Sakala is here to speak about that. Hey, I'm just gonna 
share my screen real quick. Uh, all right, you can all see that. All right. Um, yeah, so I am representing the organizer for the Applied Category Theory uh, MRC Week. Um, and I'll just give you, you know, I only got 10 minutes, so I'll give you like a very high level uh, perspective of what's going on this week. Uh, so here's all the organizers. You can see me in the bottom left there. And we're, you know, we're a fun group of people to hang out with for a week and do some math. Um, so applied category theory, uh, before I get into what we're actually doing, it might be worth saying a word or two about what it is. So it's a fairly new-ish field. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's people applying category theoretical methods to real world type problems. Um, and so some recent examples of applications that people are currently interested in is listed here. Uh, but if you want to dig a little bit deeper, uh, a quick and easy way to do so is just Google applied, uh, applied category theory conference. And that'll bring you to you know, the international annual conference that we have. And listed there will be a bunch of preprints and white papers. So you can get a really good uh, aerial view of you know, the current state of the field. So as to what we'll be up to that week, uh, we are looking at three main areas. One little project in chemistry, specifically reaction networks and petri-nets. We'll have a project kind of in computer science where we'll talk about lenses and index containers and partial compilers, and also a social science um, project. So I'll get you a little more detail about these three. Not too much detail, but a little bit. Um, so the reaction network is roughly a graphical representation uh, of different chemical reactions. Uh, this is what's called a petri-net. And so kind of the, uh, the goal of this project is going to be to understand the sort of dynamics of different chemical reactions. Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, applied category theorists are interested in compositionality, which means that if you have one of these diagrams representing some sort of chemical reaction, uh, and you have a bunch of others that you can sort of like stick together somehow in some sort of coherent way, uh, how do you how do the dynamics of the individual pieces relate to the dynamics of the whole, whole overall picture? And so category theory is, you know, offers a really nice way of uh, studying this. And so if you're someone who is kind of interested in chemistry or dynamical systems, this might be a fun project for you. Uh, the other projects will be about lenses via dialectic categories. So, Lenses, uh, what is a lens? Well, it's one of those sort of mysterious mathematical objects that seems to have been discovered many times independently. And maybe in the past five years, uh, you know, the group of applied category theorists really crystallized that, oh, this thing keeps coming up. It's super interesting. Let's start studying it for its own sake. And they started finding it in even more places. Uh, and so you see it in all kinds of areas of computer science. And so, Roughly what a lens is, is you can think of it as a pair of two interacting systems uh, that where the behavior of one system affects the other and vice versa. And you can, we can sort of mathematically model this with these two kind of functions here where there's a sort of forward flow of information and a sort of backward flow of information. Um, and that doesn't really give you much sense of what it really is, but it, I promise you it's, it's pretty fun once you dig your teeth into it. Uh, but the idea for this project is going to be working with a categorical formulation of lenses uh, and applying it to study index containers, which are a sort of mathematical representation of how you store data types in memory and like computer memory, and also partial compilers, which is you know, a technique in computer programming uh, optimization. And so if you're someone who's into mathematical logic and computer science, uh, this might be a fun project for you. Uh, the final project is uh, an extension of, let's see, uh, what are they? Social networks, right? So 
it's a it's an old idea to use graphs, different kinds of graphs to study uh, social networks. And so what this project is going to explore is to not just study sort of first order relationships between social agents, but to also see if there are uh, higher dimensional uh, relationships, like relations between relationships or relationships between those and so on uh, ad infinitum. And so one of the ideas is to use simplicial complexes uh, together with topological data analysis to study uh, these higher order relationships. And so that's a quick overview of the three projects. Uh, if you're someone who likes topology or social networks or graph theory, these kind of things could be a fun project for you. Um, so uh, I will take questions, but maybe before I do, uh, I'll just say that I was actually a participant myself uh, a few years ago in an MRC project in homotopy type theory. Uh, and I had a blast. Um, so I got a paper out of it. And I also got a letter of recommendation that I still use today out of it. Uh, and I still keep in touch with people that I met there. Uh, I made a few friends. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's worthwhile. And you know, things you things you do there will last longer than just the week that you're there. So if you have any questions, uh, you can either send me an email right there, or you know, I'm happy to take some now too, or whenever I guess we're gonna redo the question section. Well, if we uh, if we don't have any right at the moment, uh, perhaps there will be some more arise. Later, all right. We'll have those. Oh, when we do the general Q and A. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you, yeah, Daniel. Thank you. Excuse me. Can I have a, ask a quick question? Certainly. I was wondering how much of this uh, program is uh, like um, programming, and how much theory is in all these projects. Uh, what are the expectations? Uh, well, for these three projects, I would assume that there's going to be zero programming in the chemical reaction network but uh, project, but that is certainly something where maybe downstream of that project, certain uh, programming type projects could come out of if that's something you're interested in. Um, the computer science one that I mentioned with the lenses and everything, um, I don't anticipate any programming happening there because it's more theoretical. Um, but again, there are people who work with index, uh, these index containers and partial compilers uh, in the world of applied category theory who do do uh, programming. Uh, I can't say how much uh, Valeria de Paiva, who was running that project, will implement. Um, and the last one, uh, you might be using some topological data analysis software uh, to run some analyses, but uh, probably it'll be more of a, a plug and play, at least for the, the first, um, you know, for the week. So I don't think you'll have to come in knowing any programming to be able to have a, a genuine interaction uh, with, with the projects. We, we do have one uh, question that has come over the, the chat. I'm tempted though to say that if we can, we, we can save those until the, the general Q&A so that each of the groups has an early opportunity here to talk a bit about, uh, about their respective conferences. So uh, Abdullah Malik, uh, we'll, we will hold on to your question until a little bit later. And any others who want to submit them along the way, please do um, through that mechanism. So, okay, well, uh, we have next, um, uh, Nicholas Garcia uh, will be talking about uh, data science at the crossroads of analysis, geometry, and topology. Hi, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let me see. Okay. Uh, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So, so first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for joining this session today. Um, um, you know, it, I, I was not expecting this uh, many participants, which is great because uh, that means that uh, potentially many of you will be will get interested in in in, in our program. 
Um, and so I am in representing uh, my, my group. Uh, so this group is formed by Marina Mela. She's a professor in the statistics department at the University of Washington. Facundo Memoli, he's in the math department at Ohio State University. Uh, Jose Perea, who recently moved to Northeastern University before he was in uh, Michigan State. And Soledad Villar, who is at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the, in the applied math uh, group. Um, so um, our, our MRC is about uh, connections between uh, what we could call uh, mathematics, analysis, geometry, and topology, and data science. And, um, and um, I want to give you a sense of, you know, where do these uh, kind of areas in math uh, come in? You know, how, how do they touch data science? And um, maybe kind of leave some concepts uh, there uh, so that, uh, you know, if you have questions on how those concepts are going to become uh, uh, specific uh, projects, then you can ask me later. So I, I want to start with a very basic uh, question, you know, what, what is data? Where do we know by, uh, where do we, uh, what do we uh, think is, is data? And, uh, and how do we analyze it? How do we use data for whatever purpose uh, we have? And of course, if we think about uh, data, then perhaps one of the first images that is going to come to mind is this uh, MNIST data set, you know, just a, a bunch of uh, hundred digits. And, um, and, but there are other things, right? Like, I mean, we can imagine that data is, uh, can come in many different representations, many different forms and flavors. I was uh, reading recently some application to some program. Uh, one of the applicants was writing that uh, for the last 30,000 hours of his life, he had been recording every single thing that he, had, he was doing during that hour. And that's a form of a data set. It's a, I don't know who would do this. This seems uh, pretty uh, strange, but let's say that for four years, this person was recording everything that he was doing for, for, for uh, one hour. Uh, anyway, so that's that's also a data set. And I guess uh, more abstractly speaking, uh, I would say that data is just a collection of objects that uh, have some relationship am among them. And uh, typically we want to view or think of those objects as uh, mathematically represented so that hopefully we can use math to analyze them. So uh, for example, in the MNIST data set, this idea of uh, there is a relationship between these objects could be in the form of, well, they are images and we can imagine that some images are closer to others. Um, and uh, in particular, we can uh, view uh, this collection of, of images in the form of a graph. And this graph, for example, can uh, or has already like some intrinsic uh, information about the entire collection of objects, which, which, uh, which objects are more similar to others, which ones are a little bit different. Um, and we, we, we already see like a, a nice uh, geometric structure arising. Now, of course, like that geometric structure can be used to uh, try to analyze, like what is this uh, collection of objects telling us about uh, maybe a phenomenon that we're trying to understand. So in this case is maybe to try to understand what is the composition of the way that we humans write uh, numbers. In the example of the 30,000 hours, I suppose that this could be a good uh, way to analyze uh, your mind, you know, what, what has going on in my life for the past four years? Do I see trends? Do I see things that are uh, kind of relevant to take into account? And um, uh, where does uh, analysis, geometry, and topology come in? Well, already here, when, once you have this uh, kind of a relationship be between the objects, you're trying to extract information, summarize information from it, you're gonna to try to do something mathematical. And one way to do that is to, for example, uh, involve uh, differential operators. Differential operators uh, may be motivated by uh, analysis, spectral geometry, give us some information about what can we say about these geometric objects. Now, when we think about data sets as geometric objects, then we can try to use those differential operators to try to get uh, something out of, uh, of, of those, of those uh, collections of objects. Um, but of course, there is also other ways in which uh, geometry and uh, enters the picture. For example, imagine that you're trying to do something like you have two data sets. One of them is the words in some language, and then the other data set is the uh, the kind of like words in a, in a different language. 
and you're trying to somehow find a correspondence between between this uh, between these two data sets, if you like. Now, if you think about each of the data sets as a geometric object, or if you like more uh, precise terms, like as a metric space, imagine, you want to understand how these metric spaces are related to each other, how different they are, and how can we compare them. And so one, in order to do this, one uh, would have to uh, kind of uh, uh, introduce a notion of distance between metric spaces, and not just any uh, kind of a notion of distance between metric spaces, but one that somehow is uh, cheaper to compute than, than others, because not only here we want to have something mathematically um, well-defined, but also sorry, something that... Sorry. But but also something that can work uh, in practice, something that we can we can uh, you know put it in a computer and we can get answers to our questions in relatively uh, short amount of time. So okay, so that's another way in which uh, you know geometry thinking, topological thinking uh, enters the picture in, in analyzing data sets. There's another uh, another uh, setting, uh, maybe a little bit more towards. Um, uh, let's say geometry and topology, which is, well, of course, when we're trying to analyze data, um, what is it, it is very important what representation uh, we are using for the, uh, for the data. And uh, in trying to exploit these representations, so we, we're trying to use this as much as possible so that whatever we, we want to say is uh, as best as possible. And typically, uh, the types of structures that are there depend on what are we trying to analyze? What are we trying to understand? If we're tr trying to understand physical systems and we just have to observe that it's not just the like specific objects, but also some symmetries that are kind of in, in, in implicit in, in, in the systems. So this idea of trying to understand symmetries and how to, uh, how to use the symmetries to um, enhance uh, this uh, data analysis procedures is something that we are definitely interested in. So how do we exploit these uh, symmetries that we see in uh, physical systems and many other uh, settings to enhance um, uh, you know, our, our prediction capabilities and our understanding of the world at the end of the day? Uh, same thing. I mean, this is basically like a, more, a little bit more um, uh, you know, so a little bit no, more nuance, uh, kind of a, a slide uh, compared to the previous one. But again, this idea of trying to understand symmetries is, is something that we we're interested in. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to give you kind of like some of this concept, just to give you an, an idea that uh, analysis, geometry, topology are uh, uh, areas of mathematics that have uh, a lot to say in in data science. And our objective is kind of to put them all together. And I think that my colleagues are all great experts in, in their corresponding fields. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so one of our ideas is to um, offer some uh, uh, mini courses before the, before the, the uh, MRC week in, in late May. Um, and uh, say somewhat uh, between April and, and May, we want to, uh, organize these mini courses on some of these topics um, so that uh, whoever is participating in our MRC uh, can uh, access this, these mini courses, give us uh, feedback in terms of what are the topics that are, they are more interested in, and just like starting this conversation of you know, the interests of our participants and our own interests, like come to the specific, uh, the specific projects that we will work on during the uh, MRC in the summer. Uh, so uh, that's the way that our MRC is going to work. Uh, we expect to be like a permanent communication uh, since, uh, you know, our participants are, once they are uh, selected, uh, we hope to have like a permanent communication for about uh, two months and a half. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the way we are organizing this. So um, if you have any questions, you can email me or I am happy to answer some questions later uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. So we are um, doing well with time at this point. And um, as you say, uh, if, if there are uh, questions people would like to ask, they can um, put them in the chat or uh, raise them when we get to the general Q&A. So uh, I did see a 
hand go up? Um, is that a quick question for right now? Um, yes, hello. Well, I was also waiting to ask this question in the end, but I'm now a bit confused because I am interested in this uh, week 1B. If I should ask the question now, maybe, and then just see if, when you want to uh, discuss that. But I was just curious how much effort is it expected uh, from us prior to the conference? So for example, for week 1B, there's a couple of these mini courses that you mentioned. Uh, so just to know how many hours per week or in total uh, are we expected to spend on this? Thank you. And yeah. thanks for organizing this and the webinar. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So. Um, it's not like the mini courses are like mandatory or not all of them. So, I mean, it depends on what your interest is. In fact, like <clears throat> once we uh, have like the, the final uh, kind of group of, of participants, we'll right away send um, uh, just a, a, a message, an email asking participants uh, for what, what, is, what are the topics that they're more interested in. And we would just encourage, uh, you know, people to uh, look at these mini courses. The mini courses, of course, you have to imagine like, okay, you're asking for the, you know, time effort on your end, but of course that that also implies some time effort on our end. So it is going to be something that, uh, you know, both our, the organizers and the participants feel, feel comfy with. But uh, uh, you know, so this is not, uh, you know, nothing more than say for each of those mini courses, it would be like two lectures, and that's it. You know, so it's more like, you know, to to kind of like have like some uh, 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 maybe material, background material that is necessary to maybe discuss uh, uh, kind of like uh, some um, more specific uh, uh, problems or projects. That, that's kind of the, the, the nature of the mini courses. And uh, we have, a, I think this is a yes, no question. Um, there are these mini courses you're talking about online? And I would assume the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's um, move on to our, our next MRC, week two A, Models and Methods for Sparse Hypernetwork Science. Emily uh, Provine and Stephen Young will be talking about that one. Thank you, Tom. Let me share my screen quickly. Um, yeah, so this is the Models and Methods for Sparse Hypernetwork Science. Um, this is somewhat of a new um, effort for MRCs in that this is uh, explicitly motivated by problems in business, industry, uh, and government. Um, I'll maybe start with uh, the team. Um, so we are distributed across three-ish uh, national labs, uh, Arik Hagberg, Hagberg at Los Alamos, uh, Bill Kay at Oak Ridge, and then Sanan Oxoy, Cliff Jocelyn, Emily Purvine, and I at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, actually, Bill has recently joined us at Pacific Northwest National Lab, so we sort of lost our, our coverage of a, a national lab. Um, I thought I'd start first off with what the national labs are. Um, I know as a grad student, as in sort of pure mathematics, I didn't really have a good sense of uh, what these national labs were and what they did, uh, even growing up with one relatively close to my backyard. Uh, so the Department of Energy has 17 national labs. Uh, that number also surprised me when I started at, at PNNL that there are so many national labs distributed across the country. Uh, so sort of in the upper Northwest is, is Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, Oak Ridge, Argonne, Sandia, Los Alamos are some of the bigger ones, but uh, there's Brookhaven in New York, uh, there's the National Re Renewable Energy Laboratory um, in Denver, um, and so they, across the national lab system, there's a, a variety of different uh, challenges, um, really motivated by uh, scientific and national needs. Um, so just to try and give a sample of some of the things that are happening across the national lab so you get an understanding of, of where we're coming from. Um, there's uh, extensive work in doing cloud modeling and understanding how clouds 
uh, influence uh, climate change and, and behaviors that work on coupling uh, high resolution simulations using advanced uh, computing techniques and supercomputers with real world observations distributed around the world. There has uh, been research on how does background radiation affects performance of supercomputing qubits? Um, how do you develop a simple system that can monitor uh, acoustics in like a school sis, uh, lab, uh, setting and determine when there's gunshots are for uh, emergency response? Um, there's work on uh, biofuel, jet fuel, um, processing nuclear materials, new catalysts for energy transformation, uh, new manufacturing processes to get more efficient copper wire and things like that, how to support a more enhanced uh, and flexible grid. Uh, and so what we end up with is a, a very interdisciplinary environment where we have teams working on, you know, mathematicians, computer science, biologists, chemists, all working together to solve uh, a science or technology challenge of uh, oppressing nature in, in, the, um, in the world. And so we have a very sort of interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, work environment that we're trying to replicate and introduce people to um, in this MRC. Emily? Thanks, Stephen. So um, all of the things that Stephen mentioned, um, well, many of them have mathematics at their core. Um, and so our MRC is gonna be focused on specifically how uh, graphs and hypergraphs manifest in some of these specific application areas uh, and the challenges that we find when, um, when we're looking at real world data um, in, in these mathematical settings. So um, it's important to note that not every network out there is social. There's so much work done in social network analysis, uh, but we do a lot of work in a variety of areas where networks also arise. Uh, the power grid is a good example where generators are connected by power lines um, and they're connected to consumers. Um, cybersecurity is another good example where computers are connected via communications that they make. Um, and then gene interactions in biology are also uh, form a network of connections um, and interactions and relationships. And notice that all of these networks look very different. They have very different structure. So not only is not every network social, not every network is small world or has the same kind of structural properties. Uh, next slide, Stephen. And also, not every network is a graph. Some networks form hypergraphs. And here I'm using the word network loosely. Most people use network and this graph as a synonym. Here I'm using network as um, kind of the more data side of networks. So things in relationship with each other. So hypergraphs are another way of capturing structurally the information of uh, relationships among objects. But instead of connecting objects pairwise, we connect objects groupwise um, to collab, uh, capture multi-way interactions and relationships. This is an example uh, from some of our work um, in a bio biological project where um, biological samples as the vertices are connected via groups of, um, of genes that are upregulated or downregulated in a collection of samples. So each one of these hyper edges represents uh, a single gene that, co that collects all of the samples, biological samples that significantly express that particular gene. Um, and so you can see that these aren't really pairwise, they're groupwise kinds of properties. Um, you can get these kinds of hyper networks or hypergraphs as co-authorship networks, as social groups and many other areas. Um, next slide. I'm trying. There we go. Um, <laughs> right. And so, some of the the real challenges we found is that you know in social networks you often see things like these densification power laws, and you think about the Facebook network, it's it's growing in size. But a lot of the networks we're interested in analyzing and understanding are are extremely sparse, um, and so there is a limited um, a, amount ability to sort of put together existing models that look like this. So example, uh, the power grid has an average degree somewhere between one and two if you're looking at the distribution level, but you look at most of the other 
sort of typical models of a, of a network um, and, and you're looking at logarithmic degree and the size to get the connectivity. So this, this contrast is, is really highlighted um, some of the, the issues in how do you take these models uh, for social networks or something and bring them over to other domains where some of the fundamental assumptions don't apply. Um, and then a similar, you know, there's this rich class of models for social and web networks and, and sort of dense-ish, sparse, but relatively dense compared to what we're interested in. Um, random models that serve, serve as a baseline for understanding uh, observed data the theory of, of, of hypergraph random models is, is somewhat behind in that in terms of how do we appropriately model uh, observed hypergraphs like collaboration networks or the gene interaction network. So one of the uh, thrusts behind this is developing new models and uh, expressions of how do we capture data that is closer to um, and how do we understand data that is closer to real world networks that are not social networks that have this sparse or hypergraph structure. Emily? Uh, so another um, observation about the difference between um, hypergraphs in theory and hypergraphs in practice is that in, in theory, a lot of mathematicians are studying hypergraphs, but they tend to study uniform hypergraphs in which all edges are the same size. Um, if you think about extremal combinatorics and other kinds of places where hypergraphs are studied on the on the theory side, they they are typically this uniform case. But in the real world, the hypergraphs are not uniform. Uh, here's a, a picture on the right of the uh, hyperedge size distribution from a cyber hypergraph, where edges range from size one to size one thousand, um, and and so obviously these are not uniform structures. And so the mathematics that people study is not going to be completely applicable to the real world um, settings. So whereas network science um, takes techniques from graph theory and applies them kind of directly, hyper network science uh, needs to make some new techniques to apply um, the theoretical work to the, to the work in practice. Um, and then additionally, uh, the increased complexity of hypergraphs beyond graphs means that generalizing certain kinds of um, methods like Laplacians or clustering is not quite so straightforward. There are choices to make um, to, to figure out how you want to generalize from the case where you have only two-way connections to where you have multi-way connections. But this increased complexity opens the door for topological methods, which we will be exploring, things like how you define um, homology or homotopy in the in the space of um, hypergraphs um, in the increased complexity. Uh, last slide, Stephen. Okay, just a few things we wanted to talk about kind of logistic wise. Our plans are to focus on business industry and government uh, problems, careers, and teaming structures. We will have introductory talks at the beginning by organizers. We'll also have some read ahead material on the various topics that you can read ahead of time. Um, we also plan to do some virtual talks by subject matter experts. So people that represent the data challenges that they have. So in biology and cyber and other kinds of uh, power grid examples, um, they'll give some virtual talks uh, to introduce people to that data have six to eight small sub teams tackling a research question related to the challenges that we mentioned on the prior slide. And we really want to try to mirror, as Stephen mentioned earlier, the interdisciplinary teaming structure. So we don't just want a team of a bunch of theoretical mathematicians. We want to have a team that has an applied mathematician, somebody who's good at software, somebody who's good maybe at, has some information about the biology or the subject matter expertise and some theoretical mathematicians all working together on a problem. That means that if you don't know how to code, that's okay because somebody else will. And so uh, we want to mix up people in that way. We will have some career development panel discussions focusing on business industry and government type careers, role of mathematicians in, in research teams, um, developing proposals for government agencies, um, applying for big jobs, preparing for big jobs, um, how to prepare students for big jobs, um, and then just life as a professional mathematician in our setting. And we were going to also encourage networking as in business industry and government, networking is key. It's, it's key everywhere, but especially I find in my setting um, where who you know helps you get on new projects and write new proposals. So we'll rotate lunch groups and mix people up 
um, to, to make sure that we get everybody meeting everybody else in, in the program. I think that's it. Oh, this is our lovely um, advertisement slide with our links and QR codes. So take a picture of that if you want. Okay, thank you, Emily and Stephen. Um, we, we had a, a one question come in the chat, but then there was uh, at least one response for that. Uh, we may want to defer discussion of that a little bit more until uh, our general Q and A because we want we got one more MRC to discuss. Um, and then I guess the uh, general answer to Benjamin Benjamin's question will uh, we'll deal with that also when we do Q and A. So um, without further ado, uh, Miklos and uh, Stefan will talk about trees in many contexts. Yes, hi, um, I will be quicker. I don't have any slides, so it's just me um, and Stefan. We will just talk. And so everybody knows what trees are, right? They are connected crops without a cycle. And uh, there are five of us in the group and two, at least two of us will talk about potential app applications of trees in biology. Nevertheless, the questions will be fully mathematical. So no knowledge of biology is presumed. But it's interesting, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, this is, I always find interesting that though these are completely valid mathematical questions and we could have asked them anyway, we didn't until the motivation from biology came around. So in particular, uh, Heather Blake, our lead organizer, will talk about phylogenetic trees, which are like family trees, and they are used to represent ancestral relations between species. So on a microscopic level, we can encode each species by its genome and use discrete models to study the mutations that occurred between related species. If we are only given the genome information for current species, we are interested in the minimum number of mutations that, that was needed to transform one genome into another. So that defines the notion of distance. And so this way we can look for the characteristics of a single common ancestor for a set of genomes and how far those genomes are from, from that single common ancestor. And Eva Tsabarka, so he, she's the other one who has serious biological implications. She will introduce tangle grams. These are pairs of rooted binary trees of the same size so that the sets of leaves in the two trees um, are matched. So there's a, match, a perfect matching between them. And uh, they are used in bioinformatics, in, for instance, in modeling co-speciation. So a layout is a specific straight line drawing and a tangogram crossing number is the minimum number of times that the lines will cross over when you draw these trees. And this tangogram crossing number is believed to correlate well with quantities such as the number of horizontal gene transfers. Okay, and then, so these were the two um, the organizers who have the biological connections. Hua Wang, a third organizer from Georgia, Georgia Southern University, will uh, talk about enumerative and extremal problems in trees under various constraints. Uh, related to these problems, one deals with graph invariants or topological indices that may be distance-based, degree-based or counting-based. In terms of the extremal structures of value or values, many pairs of these invariants display a high level of correlation. Every graph invariant defined in an entire tree may also generate local versions of the corresponding measurement or enumeration that depends on the particular vertices. Um, okay, so that's what Hua will do. Uh, finally, let me say a little bit about my own work and then I will let Stephen talk about his. Stefan, talk about his, sorry. So when you look at, when you count trees and you ask, uh, if you take a, a tree of a given kind, I don't know, binary plane tree, or, or your, take your favorite kind of tree. So if you take a given, uh, take one at random of a given size, you could ask many questions about that. How will it look like? Like how long will be the longest path or how many children will the root have or, or the like? These questions are fairly well understood and many answers are known if the statistics somehow originate from the root, like how many vertices are 
on average, what's the average distance from the root, for instance, or, or how, how many children or, or grandchildren does the root have? Those are fairly well done. But much less is known, and this has been only done in the last 10 years or rather last eight years. If the enumeration starts from the fringe, so on average, how many leaves will there be? How many neighbors of leaves? How many neighbors of neighbors of leaves? And this has many uh, practical applications because you can look at networks where the leaves are the people who just joined or, or the, you know, the, the, there are the people who had, a lot, who had a lot, who were very active, but not recently. Recent, recently, they are not so active anymore. So they have maybe grandchildren, but they don't have children or they, 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 are, they are at a low distance from the closest leaf, but, but nevertheless, not a minimal distance. Um, so we will, uh, I will look at these problems. And Stefan? Thank you very much. I don't have much to add in terms of concrete problems. I mean, uh, Miklos has really presented the uh, array of questions and problems uh, that we will be looking at in our workshop. Um, I have been working on various questions uh, concerning trees in one way or the other over the past 15 years, uh, even more than that. Um, a friend and collaborator of mine once uh, gave me the title Tree Hugger, which uh, I take particular <laughs> pride in. Uh, so it, it's quite amazing to me in how many different contexts trees really occur. Miklos has mentioned uh, biology, chemistry. It, they occur in computer science in memories. Um, and uh, you really get a lot of uh, interesting questions that are uh, also quite natural from a purely mathematical point of view. Uh, but as he said, often mathematicians don't even look at them until some application comes along where the question suddenly becomes relevant. So um, I look very much forward to this workshop. I think we will have uh, a lot of nice questions on trees to talk about. Particularly grateful that I uh, can be part of it uh, as a non-American. So I, yeah, I really think that it will be a nice event. Very good. Thank you, Mikosh and Stefan. Um, well, we are to the point of um, being able to address uh, questions in uh, in general and in particular, if um, if we have uh, more focused questions. Um, so, without further ado, I'll back up uh, just a moment because I believe there were one or two questions from earlier on that um, we might want to, to look at. There was a question, I think this was specifically for the applied category group, and it had to do with using simplicial complexes as opposed to simplicial sets. Uh, so that's a pretty uh, specific question, but uh, maybe it has a, uh, a brief answer that comes from Abdullah Malik. Um, if Abdullah is here still, then. Um, well, it's a little detailed. I don't really know if I can give okay. uh, an answer to that now, but that's something that, of course, uh, when you get in there into the project and before the project, you get into all these little nitty gritty details and you sort of settle uh, questions. Okay. Well, uh, those details, yes, will we, it sounds like emerge then potentially. Uh, farther into the into the program, um, and there was a question about hyperedge of size one, and I believe we have two answers for that. So maybe that's sufficiently answered at this point. Those are uh, again fairly detailed sorts of questions. Um, there is a general question that I've given a partial answer to about. Um, uh, funding and um, so forth. There, I will just say in general that uh, the program provides for uh, funding for 40 participants uh, in each of the MRCs. Uh, up to 15% of the participants can be international, meaning uh, based not in the United States. Um, the, the chances are um, uh, zero of 
having funding if you don't apply, uh, and they increase to a positive, some positive value after that. Uh, and I, I don't say that lightly, maybe that's not exactly the right way to, to put it, but um, uh, it is true that we, we encourage all who are interested and um, meet the qualifications to, uh, to apply. Uh, and that's, um, that's a, an important step. So I would say that's, um, that, that's a, a general answer here. Uh, we, we want people to apply, learn more about this and uh, try to optimize their, their chances of, um, of admission. So are there other questions? Okay, we have one from uh, Jordi. Lopez Garcia, a uh, question about um, chemical reaction networks and petri nets. How much chemistry background would be needed for that program? Uh, zero. Okay. Uh, just a willingness to to learn <laughs> and to have fun with it. But yeah, you don't need need any. All right. Very good. Um, so if uh, anybody was wondering, uh, more or less the same applies to our workshop. So if anybody has a background in biology or chemistry or, or computer science, it's fantastic. It uh, can be very useful for some of the problems we look at, but it's not at all a requirement. Okay. Uh, Alex Kunin has a question. Alex, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Um, so thanks for hosting this webinar because I had questions and now I can ask them. Um, so one, uh, you already mentioned how many people per group is, it, are we allowed to apply to more than one? Um, there's, there's two that sort of strike my interest. I think one makes more sense for me than the other, but. Uh, yes, you can apply to more than one, uh, but you can only participate in one. Uh, so um, that would mean, for example, if you apply to two, and uh, the organizer team would like, the teams would like to admit you into both of those, then there would be a, a choice for you to make about which one to participate in. Does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, I, I was just wondering, that basically it's, is the application, are you sending an application, I haven't looked at the application process yet, am I sending an application per per group if, you know, if I want to apply to more than one, it's not some global? That's right, you would, I believe the uh, forms are such that uh, there's a separate application form for the four different uh, groups, so uh, you would have to go into those and separately apply in each. Um, That, that would be the procedure. The, the, uh, the links on the uh, MRC pages uh, go directly to the, uh, that application portal in math, uh, math programs. So, um, okay. Is that, were, was that the only question you had, Alex? I think you've mentioned a couple, but. Uh, the last one is, is uh, are, I guess, are there options for, remote participation if you're accepted, because I'm expect that I'm expecting my child to be born like the week of the one of the workshops that I want to go to. Uh, I think it's it's fair to say that uh, for for a variety of reasons, uh, we are looking at how uh, we may be able to offer at least some limited hybrid participation in this. Our, our, our general objective in running the programs in this way is, is to provide a, a context where people can be uh, relatively free of concerns in, in other areas of their life. Uh, the sort of thing you mentioned though is, is one that is, <laughs> is going to happen when it happens. And so yeah. uh, 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 we're at work on how that might, how uh, hybrid participation might work. Uh, so uh, I guess the best answer is to stay tuned there. Uh, we're working closely among multiple departments here at AMS to, uh, to sort out how best to do that. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. Tatum, as a question more generally, what kind of background knowledge do applicants need to have? Um, we've heard from two of the MRCs. Uh, the other two, uh, you, do you want to uh, chime in about, about that? Uh, what sort of preparation sort of sure, outside, I, extra mathematical? I can jump in for the um, hyper network graphs and hypergraphs one um, that we don't necessarily expect specific background that everybody has. We more are looking for a variety of backgrounds. It would be great if you have experience in graphs and hypergraphs um, on the math side, uh, if you have experience in programming, if you have experience in applied math. Um, we we want to put people together in, in interdisciplinary teams, as we mentioned. So. Um, it, you know, if you don't have programming experience, that's okay. Somebody else will. If you don't have experience in biology, that's okay. Maybe somebody else will. If you are not a theoretical mathematician, but you're an applied mathematician, that's okay. Somebody else will do the theory. So um, we're, we're looking for a variety of types of backgrounds in our MRC week. Yeah, so I, I should also uh, say about the the uh, data science uh, MRC. So similar to what Emily described for her MRC, um, you know, we, we will provide, uh, we're not expecting a specific background. Uh, maybe some background is encouraged, but it's not, it's not a requirement. And our idea is to form groups that have like a variety of, you know, uh, backgrounds and also seniority. I mean, maybe put together like, uh, uh, people who have already gotten their PhDs with uh, people who are working towards a PhD and even even people who uh, don't are not even uh, uh, trying to, uh, getting a PhD right now. So I mean the idea is to to put to put together different kind of a uh, backgrounds. Um, and as I said, uh, we we will also provide um, uh, some uh, material uh, in preparation for the MRC uh, week. Very good. So uh, I hope that uh, provides you uh, not with, uh, uh, excuse me, taken uh, with a good answer. Uh, Kim has, uh, Kim Kuda has put into the chat uh, the application link. So there, there's information there. We have a question from uh, Abadin uh, Mohammed. Uh, uh, he indicates that he's from Iraq and um, can you apply? And the short answer is yes. Um, the, um, uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, the program does provide for up to 15% of the participants to uh, be international. So uh, that's, uh, uh, there's a pathway to participation for, uh, for some number of international people. Sarah Loeb, you uh, have a question. Do you want to unmute and ask that? Um, on the website, it says that if you've participated in a one MRC in the past, then you are eligible to apply again, but should specifically address how participating in a second would be beneficial. Um, where should that go in the application? There's, uh, there's a section where each applicant uh, responds to a couple of prompts about their um, ability to benefit from and contribute to the, uh, the workshop. And I think there is the appropriate place to okay. put that. Kim is um, not able to confirm. Yeah, there's a word cap on that section. And so I wanted to just double check if, not that I have written things and anticipate brushing up against it yet, but wanted okay. to clarify that it was part of that um, cap section. Um, and then do you know about the potential impact on your application that previous participation would have in terms of acceptance? Uh, I think that, um, well, the, each organizer team uh, functions as admission committee, so it will be uh, largely up to them to uh, to sort of take that into account, whatever whatever you describe there. Uh, it's we have had people in the past um, 
uh, participate more than once. So um, you know, there, there are precedents for that. And there are other potential factors. Our, our goal in the program overall is to um, spread the opportunity as broadly as possible. And uh, so that, that's a force that uh, tends to militate against repeating. But on the other hand, uh, people are at different stages of development. And uh, it may very well be that particip participating once or a second time uh, can be of, of great benefit both to the, to the MRC as well as to the individual. Thank you. So, okay. Um, oh, and I am not, I'm glad you mentioned that. Emily, a couple of hands raised as well. So uh, uh, since there are no more in, well, okay, we just now got another in the chat. Uh, I think a quick answer for Ibrahim uh, Gide would be in response to his question, how to apply for computer science applicants. And it would be the same for everyone. Uh, simply go through the, uh, the portal that's provided. Uh, there's no specific direction for people with different uh, specializations to follow. So um, let's see. Oh, yes. Okay. There are two, two hands, now three. Uh, Renata. Uh, well, I already got a chance to ask a question, so I would rather first let uh, Sean and Anastasia ask their questions, okay. and if there's time. That sounds good. Uh, Sean? Well, I, did Sean disappear? Looks no, you're muted still, Sean. Oh, sorry, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks. So my first question is um, just general about the application. So on the online application, it seems like there's a it's possible to upload a second letter of recommendation, but I know the instructions say only one letter of recommendation. So is it encouraged or optional to upload a setter letter of rec? Uh, I think it's safe to say it's optional. Uh, it, it, it's fine if you want to do that, but it's, it is not required or expected. Great. And I had, um, a couple other questions for Nicholas. Um, I'm interested in the data science um, um, mini course, or not mini course, with the uh, research community. Um, my two questions are, are, are we going to be doing any coding? And two, you kind of shared what you were thinking about the mini courses, if you could just share a little bit more about I don't know, are we going to have a mini course for every single kind of topic, like such as one for manifold learning, one for metric geometry or, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. thank you Sean, for, for your question. So um, uh, let me start with the second one. Uh, so, uh, I mean, while the, let's say the mini courses will be for each of those topics that I listed. So for example, manifold learning, as you mentioned, it would have one. The idea of course is to uh, kind of like draw connections between all of them. And, and this is kind of like one of the things that we're gonna try to do. I mean, this, this is on our, on our part, like, you know, like try to connect things as much as possible. Uh, but yeah, but each mini course will have a, sorry, each topic will have a mini course. Um, and for the, for the first one, what was the first one again? <laughs> oh, are we going to be coding? Oh, yeah. So um, let's say that uh, that's also something that will depend on uh, you, the the participants, in the sense that uh, some of you may be interested in, in doing that, and for sure there will be projects that will be more applied in nature. Maybe there will be some more that are a little bit more theoretical, but uh, we'll kind of like. Uh, ask that from from you like you you know we'll ask from uh, for your feedback so that you tell us like what are you more interested in and again uh, this is something that we'll try to do essentially as soon as the kind of like uh the uh deadline for applications closes there will be a couple of weeks when we will be choosing the the, the participants and right after that once once the list is complete we'll contact you guys uh, with just like a google form or something where you will indicate i'm interested in more applied stuff, more theoretical, this area, this other, from these mini courses, which one you would be inter interested in participating, et cetera, et cetera. So, but then, uh, yes, in principle, if you if you are interested in that, then that that can, um, you know, that can happen. And if you're not interested, then that's also okay. 
good. Uh, Anastasia, do you have a question? Yeah, hi. Actually, one of my questions was just answered by Nikos about the timeline. Uh, and just wanted to thank you for organizing uh, such mathematical communities. I think it's just wonderful. Uh, what I'm actually interested in is um, the uh, hypergraph part. Uh, I studied graph theory, matroid theory in my master's, and now I'm doing like more applied numerical linear algebra stuff. And I'm really excited to be able to combine it. Uh, so, but the most part I'm excited is, is uh, the career development opportunity you mentioned. Is it gonna be during the summer part like that week that we're gonna work? Yeah, we plan to have some panel discussions and um, you know, evening career development type um, events. So that that's gonna be during that week. That's the plan Thank right you. now. Uh, Renata, I think we're back to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so my question kind of has two parts, uh, one that is more general and leans to a, a previous discussion, uh, and then one more specific to my case. So my first question is, um, or first part of the question, what is the acceptance rate in general from previous years? Uh, in recent years, uh, we have roughly uh, twice as many applications as there are fundable positions. So okay. uh, that's, and it's that's 40, 40 uh, participants in each of the groups and not in total. Correct. So a total oh. among all four of 160 participants. Ah, that's OK. Cool. OK, great. So the second question uh, that is more specific. So um, I am doing, in general, my PhD in Belgium. But I'm currently a Fulbright visiting scholar at UCLA here for nine months. So I'm not really sure if uh, I'm considered to be based in the US or a foreigner. Uh, you're considered based at the US based if um, at the time of the conference, you are uh, an employee or a, a student in a US university. So uh, mm. if you're at UCLA, then that, that would make you uh, US based. Yes, because also that my program normally ends on 31st of May. And then I have uh, a grace period with my visa for one month to stay here in June. And the conference is first week of June. So I'm a bit uh, confused. Uh, yeah, how do I, where do I actually stand? Because uh, that influences my chances, right? To a great extent of being accepted. Uh, as far as admission goes, I would, I would say, not. I mean that uh, that's that sort of status is uh, is not one of the first considerations. Uh, so uh, I, I say that not knowing fully what all of the uh, organizer teams anticipate, but I would say from from our perspective at AMS, that's uh, that that's um, that's something where there might be some questions, as in your case, to to answer of uh, how. <laughs> Where is the dividing line? Uh, and uh, of course, it, it might be that the, that dividing line is immaterial in your case anyway, uh, depending upon uh, the number of international uh, individuals who would, who would be participating. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks yeah. so much. So I think uh, we had a question from uh, Bahadin. Mohammed, uh, about do we need uh, background and data analysis? Uh, I, I don't know if that's directed at one specific group. In certain ways, multiple uh, MRCs have to do with uh, data analysis, data science. Uh, so if someone wants to give a quick answer for that, that'd be great. Uh, short answer for the hypernet project is, is no um, we're expecting a mix of people like emily has said you know and, and like is very common in the national labs you know you're not going to be an expert in all aspects of a problem and it's it's really working across disciplinary boundaries 
um, and oftentimes quite wide disciplinary boundaries. So you know. Okay. Oh wow. I think that's probably uh, it's probably a similar answer for uh, for Nicholas and and potentially others. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question here about do, do we have any projects for data science MRCs like other MRCs? And uh, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret the question. Um, it's in the chat. I can Go give ahead. it a try. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm assuming that this is a question for, for the MRC in, in data science. So. Um, well, not at the moment. There is no specific project like prove this or do this or work with this data set. There is no such a thing right now. Uh, as I said uh, before, part of this is because, first of all, the, the description of the MRC and let's say our, our intention right now is, is quite broad, right? Like, I mean, is it's when we talk about uh, data science at the intersection of three huge fields in math, you know, that, that is quite broad uh, as it is stated. But again, because it's a it's a, a broad topic, then we will work with the applicants and the participants to narrow it down precisely to some of the uh, things that uh, the, the participants are interested in, as well as some of the things that we are interested in. I mean, of course, in terms of like uh, specific research projects, um, there is always, uh, you know, the, each of each of the uh, organizers has like a a, a, a very broad uh, kind of a, a collection of of uh, of uh, a specific research projects. But of course, the specific thing about this MRC is to try to put them together. Like you know, that this is at the intersection of all of this. Not not that you know, for example, Jose who works on uh, topological data analysis that he does his thing, and then Soledad who works on more uh, optimization based uh, things that she does her thing. No, the idea, of course, is to is to put it together. Uh, but uh, but for that to happen, uh, we will uh, kind of uh, reach out to to you to get to know what are the things that uh, you are more interested in, because uh, uh, again, the, the 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 description so far is quite is quite broad. So it will be a permanent communication. Uh, and that's why I was talking about starting early on, like, say, March, early March and throughout the, the spring semester. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from uh, uh, Sean Makasa uh, about the special sessions at the joint meetings. Uh, I guess I can answer that since it applies broadly uh, across all the MRCs. The program does provide uh, support, limited support for uh, participants to travel to the joint meetings, the subsequent to their summer conferences. So uh, that would mean funded participants in the 22 MRCs will, uh, will have support to go to JMM in 23 in January. Uh, that's uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, that sort of fits in with the professional development uh, element of the program. And it also is there because uh, these special sessions, uh, there is a special session for each MRC uh, that is on that topic uh, at the, the joint meetings. Uh, <clears throat> so we very much want participants to, um, to be in, in those. In, in a sense, those are an extension of uh, what, what you've been doing at the summer conference and uh, with in, individual follow-up collaborations. Uh, so it, it presents a, a lot of opportunity there. There will be um, two or three participants selected to be the organizers for those special sessions. So for those individuals, um, this is a, a, a bit of work, but it's also a nice professional development opportunity that's, uh, that's part of the program. So Sean, I hope that answered your question. Okay, so a question from um, Jordi. Uh, when do the, these are the MRC summer conferences I'm assuming you're referring to. 
Uh, the dates of those are on the website, the MRC website. Uh, broadly speaking, they take place during the two weeks, starting May 29th and ending June 11th. So uh, that is the timetable for them. All right. Other questions? These are the great uh, pieces of conversation here. We are actually coming up on the end of 1.5 hours, which was the time we had allotted for our um, webinar, the Q&A. So uh, if there are not any other remaining questions right now, uh, that's fine. I, I think we have put into the chat uh, an email address where you can send follow-up questions. We can send those out to other individuals if we need to. Uh, there's ample information on the AMS website. So thank you again for coming. And um, Kim is uh, sharing her screen uh, with some of that information. Thank you to the organizers. Yes, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, their willingness to participate here and engage in conversation.